Chapter Five of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, a Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Introduction, The Last Abbot of Whaley. Chapter Five, The Midnight Mass. Dolefully sounds the All Souls' bell from the tower of the convent church. The bell is one of five, and has obtained the name because it is told only for those about to pass away from life. Now it rings the knell of three souls to depart on the morrow. Brightly illumined is the fane, within which no taper hath gleamed since the old worship ceased, showing that preparations are made for the last service. The organ, dumb so long, breathes a low prelude. Sad it is to hear that knell, sad to view those gloriously dyed panes, and to think why the one rings, and the other is lighted up. Word having gone forth of the midnight mass, all the ejected brethren flock to the abbey. Some have toiled through miry and scarce passable roads. Others have come down from the hills and forded deep streams at the hazard of life, rather than go round by the far-off bridge and arrive too late. Others, who conceive themselves in peril from the share they have taken in the late insurrection, quit their secure retreats and expose themselves to capture. It may be a snare laid for them, but they run the risk. Others, coming from a yet greater distance, beholding the illuminated church from afar, and catching the sound of the bell tolling at intervals, hurry on, and reach the gate breathless and well-nigh exhausted. But no questions are asked. All who present themselves in ecclesiastical habits are permitted to enter, and take part in the procession forming in the cloister, or proceed at once to the church if they prefer it. Dolefully sounds the bell. Barefooted brethren meet together, sorrowfully salute each other, and form in a long line in the great area of the cloisters. At their head are six monks, bearing tall lighted candles. After them come the choiristers, and then one carrying the host between the incense-bearers. Next comes a youth holding the bell. Next are placed the dignitaries of the church, the prior ranking first, and the others standing two and two according to their degrees. Near the entrance of the refectory, which occupies the whole south side of the quadrangle, stand a band of halberdiers, whose torches cast a ruddy glare on the opposite tower and buttresses of the convent church, revealing the statues not yet plucked from their niches, the crosses on the pinnacles, and the gilt image of St. Gregory de Northbury, still holding its place over the porch. Another band are stationed near the mouth of the vaulted passage, under the chapter-house and vestry, whose grey, irregular walls, pierced by numberless richly ornamented windows, and surmounted by small turrets, form a beautiful boundary on the right, while a third party are planted on the left, in the open space beneath the dormitory, the torchlight flashing ruddily upon the hoary pillars and groined arches, sustaining the vast structure above them. Dolefully sounds the bell, and the ghostly procession thrice tracks the four ambulatories of the cloisters, solemnly chanting a requiem for the dead. Dolefully sounds the bell, and at its summons all the old retainers of the abbot press to the gate, and sue for admittance. But in vain. They therefore mount the neighbouring hill, commanding the abbey, and as the solemn sounds float faintly by, and glimpses are caught of the white-robed brethren gliding along the cloisters, and rendered phantom-like by the torchlight, the beholders half imagine it must be a company of sprites, and that the departed monks have been permitted for an hour to assume their old forms and revisit their old haunts. Dolefully sounds the bell, and two beers, covered with palls, are borne slowly towards the church, followed by a tall monk. The clock was on the stroke of twelve. The procession, having drawn up within the court in front of the abbot's lodging, the prisoners were brought forth, 
and at sight of the abbot the whole of the monks fell on their knees. A touching sight was it to see those reverend men prostrate before their ancient superior, he condemned to die, and they deprived of their monastic home, and the officer had not the heart to interfere. Deeply affected, Paslieu advanced to the prior, and raising him, affectionately embraced him. After this, he addressed some words of comfort to the others, who arose as he enjoined them, and at a signal from the officer, the procession set out for the church, singing the Pasibo. The abbot and his fellow captives brought up the rear, with a guard on either side of them. All souls' bell tolled dolefully the while. Meanwhile, an officer entered the great hall, where the Earl of Derby was feasting with his retainers, and informed him that the hour appointed for the ceremonial was close at hand. The Earl arose and went to the church, attended by Bradill and Asherton. He entered by the western porch, and proceeding to the choir, seated himself in the magnificently carved stall, formerly used by Paslieu, and placed where it stood a hundred years before by John Eccles, ninth abbot. Midnight struck. The great door of the church swung open, and the organ pealed forth the De Profundis. The aisles were filled with armed men, but a clear space was left for the procession, which presently entered in the same order as before, and moved slowly along the transept. Those who came first thought it a dream, so strange was it, to find themselves once again in the old accustomed church. The good prior melted into tears. At last the abbot came. To him the whole scene appeared like a vision, the lights streaming from the altar, the incense loading the air, the deep diapasons rolling overhead, the well-known faces of the brethren, the familiar aspect of the sacred edifice, all these filled him with emotions too painful almost for endurance. It was the last time he should visit this holy place, the last time he should hear those solemn sounds, the last time he should behold those familiar objects. Ay, the last. Death could have no pang like this. And with heart well-nigh bursting, and limbs scarcely serving their office, he tottered on. Another trial awaited him, and one for which he was wholly unprepared. As he drew near the chancel, he looked down an opening on the right, which seemed purposely preserved by the guard. Why were those tapers burning in the side chapel? What was within it? He looked again, and beheld two uncovered biers. On one lay the body of a woman. He started. In the beautiful but fierce features of the dead, he beheld the witch, Bess Demdike. She has gone to her account before him. The malediction he had pronounced upon her child had killed her. Appalled, he turned to the other bier, and recognised Cuthbert Ashbead. He shuddered, but comforted himself that he was at least guiltless of his death, though he had a strange feeling that the poor forester had in some way perished for him. But his attention was diverted towards a tall monk in the Cistercian habit, standing between the bodies, with the cowl drawn over his face. As Paslew gazed at him, the monk slowly raised his hood, and partially disclosed features that smote the abbot as if he had beheld a sceptre. Could it be? Could fancy cheat him thus? He looked again. The monk was still standing there, but the cowl had dropped over his face. Striving to shake off the horror that possessed him, the abbot staggered forward, and reaching the presbytery, sank upon his knees. The ceremonial then commenced. The solemn requiem was sung by the choir, and three, yet living, heard the hymn for the repose of their souls. Always deeply impressive, the service was unusually so on this sad occasion, and the melodious voices of the singers never sounded so mournfully sweet as then. The demeanour of the prior never seemed so dignified, nor his accents so touching and solemn. The sternest hearts were softened. But the abbot found it impossible to fix his attention on the service. The lights at the altar burned dimly in his eyes, 
the loud antiphon and the supplicatory prayer fell upon a listless ear. His whole life was passing in review before him. He saw himself as he was when he first professed his faith, and felt the zeal and holy aspirations that filled him then. Years flew by at a glance, and he found himself sub-deacon. The sub-deacon became deacon, and the deacon sub-prior, and the end of his ambition seemed plain before him. But he had a rival. His fears told him a superior in zeal and learning, one who, though many years younger than he, had risen so rapidly in favour with the ecclesiastical authorities that he threatened to outstrip him, even now, when the goal was full in view. This darkest passage of his life approached, a crime which should cast a deep shadow over the whole of his brilliant after-career. He would have shunned its contemplation if he could. In vain it stood out more palpably than all the rest— his rival was no longer in his path. How he was removed the abbot did not dare to think, but he was gone for ever, unless the tall monk were he. Unable to endure this terrible retrospect, Paslew strove to bend his thoughts on other things. The choir was singing the Dies Irae, and their voices thundered forth, Rex tremendi majestatis, qui salvandos nalas gratis, salva me fons pietatis. Fain would the abbot have closed his ears, and hoping to stifle the remorseful pangs that seized upon his very vitals with the sharpness of serpent's teeth, he strove to dwell on the frequent and severe acts of penance he had performed. But he now found that his penitence had never been sincere and efficacious. This one damning sin obscured all his good actions, and he felt that if he died unconfessed, and with the weight of guilt upon his soul, he should perish everlastingly. Again he fled from the torment of retrospection, and again heard the choir thundering forth, Lacrimoso dies illa, quaris oged extra villa, judicandos homo reos, huic ego pare deos, iege judomine donna reis requiem. Amen, exclaimed the abbot, and bowing his head to the ground, he earnestly repeated, Pie Jesu Domine, Dona es Requiem. Then he looked up, and resolved to ask for a confessor, and unburden his soul without delay. The offertory and post-communion were over. The requiescat in pace, awful words addressed to living ears, were pronounced, and the mass was ended. All prepared to depart. The prior descended from the altar to embrace and take leave of the abbot, and at the same time the Earl of Derby came from the stall. "'Has all been to your satisfaction, John Paslew?' demanded the Earl, as he drew near. "'All, my good lord,' replied the abbot, slowly inclining his head, "'and I pray you think me not importunate if I prefer one other request.' I would fain have a confessor visit me, that I may lay bare my inmost heart to him, and receive absolution. I have already anticipated the request, replied the earl, and have provided a priest for you. He shall attend you within an hour in your own chamber. You will have ample time between this and daybreak to settle your accounts with heaven, should they be ever so weighty. I trust so, my lord replied Paslew, but a whole life is scarcely long enough for repentance, much less a few short hours. In regard to the confessor, he continued, filled with misgiving by the earl's manner, I should be glad to be shriven by Father Christopher Smith, late prior of the abbey. It may not be so, replied the earl, sternly and decidedly. You will find all you can require in him I shall send." The abbot sighed, seeing that remonstrance was useless. "'One further question I would address to you, my lord,' he said, "'and that refers to the place of my interment. Beneath our feet lie buried all my predecessors, abbots of Whaley. 
Here lies John Eccles, for whom was carved the stall in which your lordship hath sat, and from which I have been dethroned. Here rests the learned John Lindley, fifth abbot, and beside him his immediate predecessor, Robert de Topcliffe, who two hundred and thirty years ago, on the festival of St. Gregory, our canonised abbot, commenced the erection of the sacred edifice above us. And at epoch, were here enshrined the remains of the saintly Gregory, and here were also brought the bodies of Helias de Workersley and John de Belfield, both prelates of piety and wisdom. You may read the names where you stand, my lord. You may count the graves of all the abbots. They are sixteen in number. There is one grave, yet unoccupied, one stone yet unfurnished, with an effigy in brass. Well, said the Earl of Derby, when I sat in that stall, my lord, pursued Pasdew, pointing to the abbot's chair, when I was head of this church, it was my thought to rest here among my brother abbots. You have forfeited the right, replied the Earl sternly. All the abbots, whose dust is crumbling beneath us, died in the odour of sanctity, loyal to their sovereigns, and true to their country, whereas you will die an attainted felon and rebel. You can have no place among them. Concern not yourself further in the matter. I will find a fitting grave for you. Perchance at the foot of the gallows. And turning abruptly away, he gave the signal for general departure. Ere the clock in the church tower had told one, the lights were extinguished, and of the priestly train who had recently thronged the fane, all were gone, like a troop of ghosts, evoked at midnight by necromantic skill, and then suddenly dismissed. Deep silence again brooded in the aisles, hushed was the organ, and mute the melodious choir. The only light penetrating the convent church proceeded from the moon, whose rays, shining through the painted windows, fell upon the graves of the old abbots in the presbytery, and on the two biers within the adjoining chapel, whose stark burdens they quickened into fearful semblance of life. End of chapter 5